Hello, my name is Rachel Sanchez, and I'm a research fellow at Gonneville and Keys and an affiliate lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. I'm also one of the conveners of the Reproductive Justice Research Network, alongside people like Katie Dow, Edino Shocknessy, Julieta Chaparro, and Sofia Ugarte. Today, we will be talking with Kalpana Wilson, lecturer in the Department of Geography at Burbeck University of London. If you haven't done so already, please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Additionally, follow us on Twitter and Facebook at ReproJustice at Chem. We hope you enjoyed this talk and thank you very much for tuning in. So uh, the conveners of this um, events uh, are a series of scholars that come from different disciplines and backgrounds. Uh, the group is composed by Aideen O'Shaughnessy, PhD candidate at the Department of Sociology, uh, Dr. Katie Dow, Senior Research Associate and Deputy Di Director of Reprosuck, uh, Dr. Julieta Chaparro, Temporary Lecturer of Reproductive Sociology, uh, Sofia Ugarte is our CIPO's doctoral fellow at Social Anthropology, and me, uh, Rachel Sanchez, I'm a research fellow at Gunville and Keys, and an affiliate lecturer at the Department of Sociology. So today we will have Aideen doing our tech and admin. So if you encounter any problems, please let us know uh, in our webpage or on Twitter uh, and, and Facebook or here on the chat. So today we're excited to introduce our second invited speaker of the year, Kalpana Wilson, who I'm very excited to present as I've been reading her work since I was like a student. So I have to admit I'm a bit of a fanboy. <laughs> Uh, so, Kalpana Wilson is a lecturer in geography, and her research explores questions of gender, race, labor, neoliberalism, and reproductive rights and justice, with a particular focus on Southeast Asia and its diasporas. Um, she's the author of Race, Racism, and Development, Interrogating History, Discourse, and Practice, um, and has published widely on race, gender, international development, women's agency, and rural labor movements. So today, Kalpana will be talking to us about the difference between reproductive rights and reproductive justice, and the subtitle of this event will be Resistant the Imperialism uh, of Global Population Policies. So I'll leave you the floor, and thank you for being with us, Kalpana. Uh Thank you very much, Rachel, and I'm really excited to be here and um, just like to say thank you to all of you who have organized this really uh, exciting and important and very timely um, series. Um, so I'm going to just um, share my screen. Um, so. Um, Yeah, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, I actually wanted to start um, this talk today with um, two fairly recent uh, news stories. So one was that um, just ahead of the COP26 uh, climate change conference, which is going on at the moment in Glasgow, um, the Science Museum in London announced that it was opening a new green energy gallery and that this was being sponsored by and named after the billionaire uh, Gautam Adani of the Indian coal mining conglomerate Adani Limited, which is currently displacing thousands of indigenous people from their lands and facing intense resistance stretching from Australia to India. Now this not surprisingly was criticized as one of the most blatant examples of what's being called greenwashing. Um, but I'll come back to Adani and what he has to do with the topic we're talking about today in a moment. Um, the second story which I wanted to mention was that a few months ago, uh, we saw the introduction of a new draft law in Uttar Pradesh state in India, which is often referred to as India's most populous state. And this uh, bill was named the Uttar Pradesh Population and in brackets, Control, Stabilization and Welfare Bill of 2021. 
So whereas a number of other states in India already have laws which prevent people with more than two children from contesting in municipal elections, this bill actually goes further. It firstly proposes very serious disincentives and disqualifications um, for people who have more than two children. And these include restricted access to food distribution schemes, um, disqualification from applying for government jobs, um, a bar on getting promoted if you're already a government employee, and ineligibility for receiving any government subsidy. And secondly, um, the bill specifically mandates uh, sterilization of one partner, which in practice means almost exclusively tubectomies for women, um, in order to access certain benefits after having two children. Now, this bill has been criticized as being an anachronistic throwback to the so-called dark ages of the coercive population measures of the 1970s. However, representing this as some kind of throwback ignores two aspects of it. Firstly, that population control policies, far from being a thing of the past, are in fact a central aspect of globally dominant sustainable development approaches in the 20th century. And in particular, of the response of capital to climate change. And then secondly, it also neglects to engage with the fact that India and the state of UP specifically are currently ruled by a far right uh, Hindu supremacist regime under Narendra Modi. And many of us would call it a fascist regime, but I can talk more about that later if you like. Um, and its leaders constantly evoke the trope of higher population growth. Uh, which is really a myth among India's minority Muslim community. So this makes it clear that it's Muslim women, along with oppressed and marginalized uh, Dalit and Adivasi or indigenous women, will be specifically targeted by such policies. So I'm going to look today at the synergies and the direct connections between, on the one hand, the global rise of far-right regimes, including India's, uh, which have meant resurgent eugenics, the preoccupation with building walls and camps, and the growth of racialized discourses of population replacement. Um, and on the other hand, population policies, which are central to mainstream notions of sustainable development. So on the face of it, this seems quite contradictory. Um, mainstream discussions of population and development mobilize notions of reproductive rights, which are antithetical to the far right. So for example, the Brazilian government under Bolsonaro withdrew from the international conference on Population and Development 25, which was held in 2019 in Nairobi. And there were homophobic and anti-abortion protests against the conference by forces directly supported by the global Christian right. Um, yet despite this apparent contradiction, if we look more closely at mainstream population policies, such as those promoted by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, we find that these are in fact deeply racialized and consistent with contemporary imperialism and accumulation by dispossession in its most recent, even more intensified phase. And this is really what I'm going to be talking about. Um, within this approach, population growth in the global south is constructed as the main cause of climate change shifting responsibility from capital to poor people in the global south, who are of course those most affected by it. And it's used to stoke racialized fears of conflict, migration, and terrorism. But at the same time, these policies mobilize neoliberal feminist understandings of reproductive rights to leg legitimize interventions in the bodies and fertilities of the most marginalized women in the Global South. So I'm going to explore this 
particularly look at how these policies actually relate to um, the mobilization of women's labor in the global south, um, to corporate dispossession and displacement, and to strategies of containment directed particularly at men who are increasingly seen as unproductive and as a threat to accumulation. Um, and I'm going to be focusing particularly um, on India. Um, and I'll also then talk about how a reproductive justice approach, but in contrast to this, um, might uh, contribute to challenging these policies and their embodied effects. So um, now population policies um, in my work, I've understood them as essentially an ongoing racialized project of capital. And they've been informed by two closely intertwined ideologies. And these are of course eugenics on the one hand and new Malthusianism on the other. So while um, Thomas Malthus's name has become synonymous with theories of uh, overpopulation, one can argue that actually his primary legacy has been to provide uh, what Roth calls um, an enduring argument for the prevention of social and economic change um, by suggesting that the poverty associated with capitalist development is an inevitable consequence of population increase rather than of the logic of capital accumulation. Um, so combined with eugenicist ideas and more broadly ideologies of racial supremacy, um, the Malthusianism of the 19th century was intimately linked to imperialism. Um, and we saw this in the later part of the 19th century, um, when you had the cumulative effects of deindustrialization caused by colonialism, uh, grinding taxation, forced cultivation of cash crops, and other forms of forcible integration into world markets, combined with El Nino crop failures. Uh, producing a series of devastating famines across much of the global south, including India, Brazil, and China. And in this period, Malthusian ideas became central to colonial policy. Um, and they were invoked to justify um, colonial powers refusing to intervene to prevent these deaths from famine in ways which in many ways are still very familiar. So for example, in India during the famine of 1876 to 1879, uh, up to 10.3 million people are estimated to have died. And we have the British finance minister at the time stating that every benevolent attempt made to mitigate the effects of famine serves but to enhance the evils resulting from overpopulation. So you get the beginnings then of this discourse of overpopulation and you can see how it's being used. Um, but it's in the context of the Cold War in the 20th century um, and the configuring of imperialism after formal colonialism. And in particular, the challenge to the existing global distribution of wealth which was posed by communist movements in the global south, uh, that you had calls for direct intervention to restrict population growth becoming mainstream. Population growth came to be seen as a source of poverty which breeds communism. And as Laura Briggs puts it, third world women's sexual behavior was rendered dangerous and unreasonable the cause of poverty and hence of communism and needed to be made known, managed and regulated. Um, so in this period then uh, of the mid 20th century and onwards, we can see population control emerging as a sustained form of racialized embodied gender violence against both women in the global south and against black women and other women of color in the north. Um, and, as, and as I'm sure you, you all know, uh, experiences of population control 
electoral policies in the 1970s and 80s become, became one of the key markers of very deep fissures along lines drawn by race, class, and imperialism within feminist movements and between them. Um, the slogan of a women's right to choose uh, was famously mobilized around abortion rights by organizations in Europe and North America, which were overwhelmingly white and predominantly middle class. Uh, but women of color were often also the target of forced sterilization or compulsory use of unsafe contraceptives. Eugenicist ideas have continued to shape policies promoting these interventions. In Europe and North America and in Israel, uh, black and indigenous and minority women, women in prison and women with disabilities continue to be particularly targeted. Um, so meanwhile, women in low income households in the global south have been denied access to contraceptive methods which were safe and which they could control. And in many countries also, of course, denied abortion rights. Simultaneously, they were subjected to the acute violence of population control policies in which targets were set by the international development institutions, including the World Bank. Um, so forcible and coercive sterilization of urban and rural poor women took place on a massive scale in this period. In Bangladesh, sterilization was in many cases made a condition for uh, women getting food relief. In India, the setting of targets for government employees uh, to produce a certain number of women uh, for sterilizations led to large scale kidnappings and not surprisingly to forcible sterilizations. And the testing and dumping of unsafe contraceptives was also a very widespread phenomenon, which I'll come back to. But, as population is now once again being emphasized as a development challenge in the 21st century, um, the discourse around population growth has changed and it's incorporated notions of reproductive rights and choices. In order to understand this a bit more, we need to look at how notions of gender equality and women's empowerment have been incorporated into dominant neoliberal approaches to international development. And now this is um, epitomized by um, the World Bank's um, approach of gender equality as smart economics. Um, now smart economics is um, premised on the assumption that uh, women will always work harder than their male counterparts and they will always be more productive. And further, they will use additional income more productively than men would. So therefore it argues that greater gender equality, which basically is understood almost exclusively as meaning an increase in women's participation in labor markets, will have a significant impact on economic growth. Um, so it's the idea that uh, you have a win-win situation where you improve gender equality by getting more women into the labor market, and then you have, um, you have economic growth and it's a so-called virtuous cycle. Now there's plenty of evidence from all over the world that when women earn uh, additional income, they are more likely to spend it on their um, households and particularly their children. Um, but the question is, of course, why it happens, and we can't understand this unless we look at um, gendered relations of power, unequal distribution of, of, of resources, which is deeply gendered, um, the kinds of things which compel women very often uh, to do more labor. Um, and of course, gendered subjectivities and the construction almost universally of ideas of the good woman and the good mother as someone who is altruistic and so on. But this gender equality smart economics approach, of course, does not question any of that. Instead, it uh, sees it as a kind of resource 
Um, so rather than building gender equality, it's actually built on the foundations of gender inequality and patriarchy. Um, now this strategy of uh, gender equality and smart economics, drawing women into the labor market, fits in with needs of capital in the neoliberal global economy in two interlinked ways. So firstly, there is the fact that intensifying women's productive as well as their reproductive labor as seen as a strategy um, for replacing state provision in contexts where households are basically being pushed to the limits of survival by neoliberal policy. And then secondly, women are being seen as what's called an untapped resource for sustaining and expanding the profits of global capital. So they're being incorporated into global value chains like garment work, um, like um, corporate agriculture and horticulture, or they're being incorporated into microfinance, which is increasingly being uh, integrated into global financial flows. Um, so within this approach then, um, women in the global south from low-income households are represented in particular very racialized ways. Um, and these are actually some um, images which are taken from uh, the international NGO Oxfam. Now in these representations, women are seen as productive, as entrepreneurial, and as endlessly resilient. So as the ideal neoliberal subjects. And in particular, they're seen as having an infinitely elastic capacity for labor. Um, and um, this differentiation according to capacities for labor has historically, of course, been extremely racialized. Um, and we can go back in the history of black feminism to Sojourner Truth's famous speech from the 19th century, Ain't I a Woman, which of course has been also written about uh, by the Black feminist theorist Bell Hooks. Um, and in that speech, um, Sojourner Truth actually talks about the fact that uh, unlike white women uh, who are seen as incapable of the same amounts of physical work as men, uh, black women, none of that is applied to black women and they're seen as capable of endless amounts of labor. And it's in that context that she's asking the question, entire woman. So of course that speech raises questions about um, the whole construction of gender and its, its connection with whiteness. Um, but this idea has uh, continued and found new applications within the context of the smart economics approach. Um, and this idea that women are always capable of more work uh, in the global South has become really pervasive within development uh, institutions at all levels. Um, and so a few years ago, and I often mention this because I really think it's so telling, um, I came across a report produced by um, the state government in Orisha in, in Eastern India, uh, which was a report into the conditions experienced by um, mainly Dalit women who were um, agricultural wage laborers. Uh, so they worked for wages in other people's fields. And it, it was looking at their, their lives and the report found that um, these women were often doing um, 16 hours a day of work if you combined uh, their work in the fields with the work they were doing within the household. And in peak season, when more work was available, it was even more than that. So the report found this, but then when it came to actually making recommendations uh, at the end of the report, the main recommendation was that these women should be given income generating activities to do in their leisure time. Um, and the report actually um, bemoaned the fact that these women were using their uh, leisure time unproductively and they were found to be doing things like uh, gossiping, playing cards, watching television and even sleeping was mentioned. 
Um, so there's really this sense that uh, women can always do more labor in these contexts. Um, now within this then, you also have uh, a new gendered and racialized version of the old binary of the des deserving and the undeserving poor. Um, so while women in the global south are now represented increasingly as a potentially ideal, altruistic, hyper-industrious neoliberal subjects, men on the other hand um, are often uh, represented in very racialized ways as unproductive, irresponsible, and uh, only committed to sensual pleasure. And this is something which I'll come back to. Um, now, at the same time, of course, we have gender inequality being assumed to be already resolved in the global north. Um, it's no longer a problem in the global north within development discourses, and it's increasingly displaced onto the global south and its diasporas. So in this context, you have gender inequality itself becoming a racial marker. Um, but the racialized and gendered representations of women from low-income households in the global south construct them in two ways, as both hyper-industrious disposable laboring bodies, as we've seen, and simultaneously as dangerous reproductive bodies. Um, so we can understand this better by looking at 21st century population policies in which, as I said, a neoliberal feminist discourse of reproductive rights and individual choice acts to mask racialized and gendered embodied violence. And there are several factors underpinning this. Um, firstly, it's once again linked to the idea of the drive to get women into global labor markets. So for example, we have a World Bank report on investing in women's reproductive health, which begins by citing the idea of smart economics, noting the effects of fertility rates on um, the female labor supply, as it put it. And then secondly, um, population policies are seen as consistent with the continuation of economic policies, which would involve the further shrinking of social spending. Um, so for example, the former British Development Secretary, Andrew Mitchell, has described population policies as excellent value for money. And he cites Tanzania, which he claims would need 131,000 fewer teachers by 2035 if fertility declines saving millions of pounds in the long run. And then thirdly, population policies which have the notion of averted births embedded in them, as Michelle Murphy has discussed, are inseparable from capital's drive to displace and dispossess poor people, and particularly indigenous communities from their land and their livelihoods. Um, so these corporate land grabs for mining, for corporate agribusiness are legitimized using the old colonial myths of the land as empty. Now, um, while um, mobilizing a discourse of reproductive choices for women, Increasingly, population policy is being promoted uh, using older neo Malthusian ideas, which explicitly invoke fears of the hyper fertile racialized other. And as we've discussed, these are now being invoked through a sustainable development discourse which links population growth uh, with climate change, terrorism, and migration. Um, and in this context, um, racialized men and adolescent boys um, from the global south are explicitly represented. Um, and they're shown as being unproductive and somehow extraneous 
to processes of global capital accumulation. And they're seen as embodying a racialized threat to security of people in the global north. Um, so while the images used by development organizations, as I'm sure you've noticed, are almost exclusively of women and children, um, this is one example on the slide where images of men were mainly used. And as you can see, these are from a 2015 report on population dynamics and the sustainable development goals. Um, produced by the UK All-Party Parliamentary Group on Population Development and Reproductive Health group Goals. And this is a group whose major donors include the UNFPA and the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Um, I've written in detail about this report and the kind of discourses it perpetuates, but you can see the way in which men are represented, uh, racialized men are represented, even by the photographs which have been chosen to illustrate this report. Um, now to fully understand 21st century population policy, we need to look at the sustainable development approach to climate change. Um, it's focus on resilience, adaptation, um, which can also be understood as strategies for containment of populations in the global south. So climate change in this approach is understood not as creating um, limits to economic growth, um, but rather seen as producing what is referred to as planetary boundaries within which business as usual can continue and capital accumulation can continue. And of course, this is the version which we are seeing put forward mainly at COP26 at the moment, where you know, the banks and the private sector assume to be uh, you know, the ones who can effectively respond to climate change. And then you have the development security approach in which the role of sustainable development is to bolster security in the global north and contain security threats. So migration, terrorism, epidemics, and so on. Um, so sustainability becomes very closely linked to containment of populations in the global south, preventing migration, strengthening the borders of the global north, whether it's uh, the Mexican US border or it's the Mediterranean Sea. And more broadly, what this actually means is that what is being sustained are the inequalities between the north and the south. Um, so climate change is now seen as being the key threat to the containment of the global south. So in this context, renewed focus on limiting population growth um, becomes very important, even though in reality, the few countries where population growth remains relatively high are the ones which have very low carbon footprints. Um, Unlike the earlier Malthusian population discourses, this becomes a way of not focusing on the responsibility of capitalism for climate change and shifting responsibility to uh, poor people in the global south who are also those most affected by climate change. Now, um, I want to talk about one of the main uh, population initiatives, uh, which is um, FP2020, and it's now been updated to be FP2030. FP stands for family planning, as I'm sure you know. Um, and I've, un I've discussed this in the context of what I'll call racialized regimes of reproduction. Now, FP2020, was launched at the London Family Planning Summit back in 2012. It was hosted by the British government um, and the Gates Foundation, along with USAID, UNFPA, and so on, with the aim of getting 120 million more girls and women in the poorest countries to use voluntary family planning by 2020. And now the claim is that actually only 60 million have been reached. And so the whole process has been extended until 2030. Um, 
Now, the kind of key approach is encapsulated in the Gates Foundation's 2012 Family Planning Strategy Overview where they say the current rates of population growth will only exacerbate the current health inequities for women and children, put pressure on social services and resources, and contribute significantly to the global burden of disease, environmental degradation, poverty, and conflict. Um, and as the uh, Gates Foundation is now the uh, major donor in, in international family planning, um, even though uh, under Biden, the global gag rule has been uh, repealed, uh, US government aid has still not returned to previous levels. So given the amount of influence which the Gates Foundation has in international family planning, its framing of family planning is very influential. And the other thing which is not often realized is that um, the Gates Foundation is itself completely opposed to abortion. Um, and this is uh, something which is particularly associated with um, Melinda Gates' personal um, views, uh, but it has informed the Gates Foundation's policy in various ways. And I think that's unlikely to change, even if, um, she doesn't continue to be involved, um, but for the moment she will be in any case. Um, so to tell you a bit more about FP 2020-2030, um, we know that women in low-income households in the Global South um, in many cases have uh, an unmet need for access to contraception, which they can control and which is safe. But what happens with uh, FP 2020 is that it focuses exclusively on the aggressive promotion of long acting implantable and injectable hormonal contraceptives. And these of course, feminist reproductive health activists have long argued uh, that they potentially undermine women's health and control over their bodies. Um, so the um, contraceptives being um, promoted in FP20 are Depo-Provera, which is manufactured by Pfizer, uh, Jadel, previously known as Norplant, which is manufactured by Bayer, and Implanon, which is also an implant manufactured by Merck. And these are promoted through what's called um, market shaping. Um, so while having targets and population policies have long been recognized as a major driver of abuses and it's claimed that they've long ended, what happens here is that private and government donors provide volume guarantees to pharmaceutical corporations. Um, so volume guarantees of the amount of um, of uh, contraceptives which will be um, which will be sold. So there you have a kind of new market-driven form of targets, as Anne Hendrickson has explained. Um, now, interestingly, injectable and implantable contraceptives are specifically being promoted as suitable for use in contexts where health provision has been decimated by neoliberal policies and continues to shrink. So in fact, a self-administered version of Depo-Provera, Cyana Press, has been introduced fairly recently. And this is despite the fact that Depo-Provera has long been opposed by reproductive health activists because of its severe side effects. It needs continuous medical follow-up by health staff in a well-functioning well health system. And it's also being promoted despite some evidence that Depo-Provera may increase the risk of women and their partners becoming infected with HIV. Um, now, recent um, ECHO trials, which were held in Kenya, South Africa, Swaziland, and Zambia on this, uh, were inconclusive and have also been crit critiqued for some very major ethical violations. But for the Gates Foundation, it appears that safety is not the main priority. 
Rather, the priority has been the promotion of methods which are seen as, as near as possible to 100% effective in preventing pregnancy, um, as these are seen as reducing the need for safe abortion. Now, um, apart from long-acting reversible contraceptives or LARCs, uh, which I've been talking about, um, you find that the, the FP2030 website also refers to permanent methods or PM. Now, what permanent methods actually refers to, what it actually means is female sterilization, so tubectomy. Um, so, for example, we have statements like the Bangla, the, the, this was several years ago, that the government of Bangladesh um, has made a commitment to increase the share of long-acting reversible contraceptives um, and permanent methods from 8% to 20%. Now, in some cases, we see that the, the commitments which governments have made under FP 2020 have also increased coercive mass sterilizations. Um, India, for example, committed to getting 48 million more women to use contraception by 2020. Um, and Human Rights Watch um, reported that this was uh, something which um, suggested that there, there was a great risk of, of abuses. Um, and then we see, this was in 2012 that India made this commitment. Um, this was uh, then uh, passed down uh, to state governments. Um, and instead of targets, you had the euphemistically named uh, expected levels of achievement for sterilizations. So in 2014, um, 15 women died after undergoing sterilization surgery. Um, under really appalling conditions in sterilization camps in one of the poorest states of India, Chhattisgarh. The women who died were all in their 20s and 30s, and they were from Dalit, uh, Adivasi, and uh, what's called uh, OBC or other backward classes communities. Most of them were from landless households and their main source of income was agricultural and other daily wage labor. But these tragic events cannot be seen as an aberration. On a national level, officially recorded deaths caused by sterilization translate into 12 deaths a month on average and actual figures are almost certainly much higher. Although camps have now been outlawed in a ruling by the Supreme Court after campaigns by feminist groups, sterilization continues to be the most common method of contraception available to women. And this continues to be actively and often coercively promoted as in the draft law in Uttar Pradesh, which I talked about at the beginning. So looking at this can help us understand how the violence of population policies operates at several different scales, from the global to the national and the local. Now, these population policies are complemented by the rise of a far-right Hindu supremacist regime in India under Narendra Modi. Um, and we've seen a number of things happening under this regime in relation to population policies. We've seen the intensification of the dispossession of people who are constructed as superfluous populations and seen as obstacles to capital accumulation. So in Chhattisgarh, the same state where the sterilization massacre happened in 2015, um, this is a key region for the militarized displacement of Adivasi or indigenous communities to make way for transnational mining corporations. This is where the Hasdeo Forest, which Gautam Adani, who I mentioned at the beginning, wants to destroy for coal mining is located. 
Indigenous communities that are facing acute violence by state paramilitaries and armed vigilante groups funded by these companies. Women who have been at the forefront of resistance to displacement, uh, like the activists Sony Sori and Hidme Markham, who's currently in jail, have been particularly targeted for gender violence. And meanwhile, the trope of high population growth rates among India's minority Muslim community in relation to the Hindu majority is a central myth which is mobilized by Hindu right-wing groups in order to orchestrate violent massacres and mob lynchings. We have politicians of the ruling party regularly calling for a law to prevent population growth among Muslims. And of course, the obverse of that is that they also call for Hindu majority women to have more children. And there's also the preoccupation with supposed illegal migrants under the Modi regime. So again, targeting Indian Muslim communities and labeling them as migrants from Bangladesh. The Narendra Modi government has introduced a national register of citizens aimed at the disenfranchisement, detention and deportation of those who are ruled to not have sufficient proof of their citizenship. And already we're seeing detention camps being built across the country. When this is combined with the new Citizenship Amendment Act, which effectively excludes Muslims from full citizenship, this has been viewed by human rights advocates as creating the conditions for ethnic cleansing. And the um, lower picture on this slide actually shows uh, women um, protesting against the Citizenship Amendment Act in some really uh, iconic protests uh, in which Muslim women organize mass sit-ins in public spaces. Uh, and this one was the first of those at Shaheen Bagh in Delhi to protest against this um, denial of citizenship to Muslims under these laws. Um, so finally, I want to talk a bit about the reproductive justice approach. Um, now, whereas the neoliberal reproductive rights approach claims to grant choices to individuals as consumers within an unquestioned market framework which as we've seen is actually structured by violence and inequality the demand for reproductive justice um, makes those broader structural forces visible the economic political and social forces which deny women control over their bodies and over wider processes of reproduction. Um, now, reproductive justice ideas, as we know, were developed by Black feminists in the US. They came out of the struggles of Black women, women of color, and Indigenous women in response to experiences like those of forcible sterilization and the coercive promotion of unsafe contraceptives in the US. So reproductive justice reflected the experiences of marginalization in mainstream reproductive rights organizations, which focused exclusively on abortion rights. Um, and as Loretta Ross writes, uh, reproductive justice represents a shift for women advocating for control over their bodies from a narrower focus on legal access and individual choice, which has been the focus of mainstream organizations, to a broader analysis of racial, economic, cultural, and structural constraints. So reproductive justice has been extended to the violation of the right to parent children in safe and healthy environments and has been invoked, for example, in struggles against racist policing of African-American children and young people. It potentially directly challenges the ideas underpinning population policies and development, which use the language of reproductive rights. Um, but we also need to understand reproductive justice as a traveling concept, which is conceptualized differently in different contexts and in different movements and struggles. 
as we've seen, struggles for reproductive justice uh, can be located as in the Indian context in the framework of other forms of ongoing resistance to global capital and its current fascist turn. Um, so I'd like to end with this proposal that questions of reproductive justice in turn must be incorporated as a central element in our understandings of borders, um, of the intensified exploitation of gendered and racialized labor, of corporate destruction and displacement, and of occupation and militarization in multiple contexts. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for talking with us, Kalpana. Um, I myself have a lot of questions, like mostly like talking about the legacies of eugenics and population control is especially relevant this year as the International Eugenic Conference like was just uh, in 1921. So like it marks a hundred years. And in this sense, like it is important to see how the legacies of eugenics, colonialism, imperialism, and its impact on population control and the struggles for reproductive justice are particularly relevant from India to the, the rest of the world. And you mentioned uh, like the borderlands, like and how like it is relevant to like focus on these places. So I have a lot of questions, but I was wondering um like if anybody had a question they can put it on the chat or they can use the raise hand function in the meantime i might just ask my question you mentioned briefly um uh issues of like environmental racism and how it is important to like approach this like in an intersectional analysis so thinking about like colonialism imperialism environmental racism as well as like issues of population control so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that mostly because I know that you talked about it in uh in your articles um yeah yeah I mean I think you know the the um one of the one of the things that I find, you know, quite, um, you know, we have to be aware of in all of this is that, you know, I've talked about, um, you know, how questions of, for example, climate justice and um, environmental justice are kind of, you know, very closely intertwined with reproductive justice. Um, but of course, you also have, you know, the kind of eco-fascism, you also have this kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a, a strand which really goes back to, you know, colonialism, which, um, you know, is very much rooted in this idea of, um, of particular humans being a threat to nature. And this is where you, you know, you get kind of now a lot of the um, support for population policies as kind of, uh, you know, the answer to climate change. So it's very much informed by that that strand in in environmental thinking, uh, which is which has also been you know um, highly gendered, which is sort of often very much very anti-feminist, which is very much uh, glorifies particular heteronormative notions of the family and so on, and all of that kind of feeds into this uh, this kind of uh, support for. Uh, population measures which are actually extremely coercive. So you have that on the one hand, but I think in some ways for, for you know, for us, it's, it's much easier to recognize that and to know what's problematic about it. I think it's the, it's the kind of discourses around women's empowerment, the fact that it sort of builds on something very real, which is the fact that, you know, very often women don't have uh, access to, uh, to um, you know, uh, contraceptives and um, to um, you know, to the, are not you know empowered to control their fertility in ways that they would choose to, uh, but that in fact becomes a kind of you know a pretext for these these interventions which I've been talking about, and that's the thing which is perhaps more difficult to decode at times. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Um, so does anybody else have any questions? <laughs>
uh, Reject. Hi, um, thank you so much for a really interesting and thought provoking presentation. I have like pages and pages of notes. Uh, it connects with my work on women, the connection between women's employment and empowerment in Benin. Uh, so there's lots to talk about on that. But as a former economist, how do you, like, I guess my question would, to you would be, how do you respond to neoliberal economists who say that the long-term economic data does show an inverse relationship between population growth, the reduction of population growth, and the increase of like this kind of graph, uh, and economic growth. And this idea that at the household level, poverty rates seem to, to decline, I'm talking mostly about the African context, but kind of globally, do decline with re reduced dependency ratios, meaning less children, less poverty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, what's interesting is that um, that shift which took place, um, you know, uh, in demography um, away from, you know, the, the idea of sort of like demographers observing um, social and economic changes to demography being a kind of something which is kind of very much weaponized for actual intervention in um, through population control and so on, which, as I said, is very much linked to the Cold War, um, that whole change. But I mean, um, if, if you look at, you know, in fact, what's happening is that in general, um, you know, population growth is decreased, it, it's decreasing quite rapidly in terms of actual uh, fertility rates in most, um, you know, in, in almost all African countries and everywhere else in the world. Um, and as I said, I mean, there's very few, there's a small number of countries in, in, in Africa where that's not the case. Um, but in general, that's, that's the pattern already. And so I think the question is really that, um, what are the, I mean, this is, this is really, you know, a result of other things which are happening in the society, right? So I think that is the, that's the question that why then um, this kind of, uh, intervention is being promoted which is which actually is um you know is a form of violence which is is not actually about any kind of choice ultimately but which is extremely coercive and there are a number of reasons for that i mean one is the way in which population growth is being constructed as a major issue for climate change and so on which is simply not the case uh, the other is, of course, you know, the creation of markets, new markets for uh, pharmaceutical companies and so on, and all of these things. Um, you know, so I think, you know, of course, you know, there are, uh, you know, that whole, that whole transition takes place, you know, um, and that's, that's already underway in, 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 you know, most parts of the world. But I think the question is about, you know, whether uh, this is something to to kind of intervene. And the other thing is really about economic about economic growth, um, which again, I mean, you know, is that really what we should be aiming at in 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 this context? The particular kind of this model of uh, high growth, high inequality, um, you know, environmental destruction. Uh, and this climate crisis is really something which then one has to ask questions when one is confronted by neoliberal uh, economies. Um, yeah, um, so there's a question in the, in the, do you want me to look at some of the questions in the chat? So I know that Rashida uh, asked uh, two questions. Like, I don't, I was wondering if she wanted to unmute herself or if I should just read the question. Uh, so yeah, I might just, oh, okay, that's fine. I'll just read the question. So hi, Kaplana, thanks so much for such a fantastic talk. I have two questions for you. You can pick one uh, if you don't want to do both, uh, but I love to hear your thoughts on, okay. Uh, first one, thinking about the international reproductive rights spaces, uh, which includes like BMFG, IPPF, etc. There have been a recent turn to using um, the expansive language and frames of reproductive justice 
to still push control Malthusian uh, empowerment ideologies, i.e. contraception is a win-win. Uh, how do we grapple with this uh, co-optation and or uh, the second? I love how you frame uh, reproductive justice as a traveling concept, yet uh, reproductive justice needs to be understood and deployed in localized ways. Do you see a tension between uh, reproductive justice as locally applied while equally contributing to a slash uh, part of a global movement? Uh, thank you. Thanks, those are two really uh, great questions and, and, you know, in a way like open up discussion, which I think it would be nice to have with, with more people uh, who are here. But um, I mean, in terms of the first question, I mean, that's something I'm really interested in because I think, you know, neoliberalism in particular has this tremendous capacity for kind of appropriating and incorporating critical ideas and in the process, of course, as you've said, kind of completely transforming their meaning. And we are seeing this with reproductive justice as well. I mean, I've noticed, um, you know, particularly, um, uh, you know, reproductive justice being used by these institutions you've mentioned and by also by um, development NGOs to refer exclusively to what they call, you know, cultural practices. Um, so that, you know, the idea that, that you know, it's, it's nothing to do with, um, you know, with these global policies, it's nothing to do with, with even with governments, it's really all to do with, um, you know, power relations and structures exclusively at the level of the community. And of course, those are really important, um, but you can't completely separate them from all of these other things which are happening. Um, so I think, yeah, we do need to be very wary of that and not also be that surprised because, you know, we've seen that happen. Of course, reproductive rights, um, you know, yes, they were used uh, in a limited way by many um, feminists in uh, the global north, but they also were used in some very, um, you know, uh, movements with some quite radical demands, but you've seen this whole thing becoming co-opted. And now I think it's not surprising that we are seeing the same thing with reproductive justice. And, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, very easy then to just uh, put it, just for sprinkling it around without any kind of fundamental change in what's being really talked about, um, as you've said here. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the question of the contradictions and tensions is really, um, it's really important and interesting, you know, because I think that, um, you know, it is, for example, that question of cooptation, you know, works in different ways, depending on where you're located and whether or not it's, it's even possible for it to be co-opted. And I think that's, um, you know, that's, and there are also contexts where people have found the rights framework more useful. So these are things which, um, you know, I think this series is one of the places that those those differences and those tensions can can come out and, and be be examined and shared. Um, so Arushi uh, says, uh, I wanted to ask you about the continued prevalence of uh, tubectomy in India. What is it about the procedure that makes it so prevalent in comparison to the implants and injectables you talked about, particularly for the Indian state and its uh, complete reliance on, the, uh, on female sterilization as a population control tool, especially in terms of being quite an inherently coercitive um, coercive procedure? Is it just the promise of permanence or perhaps more than that? I mean, the whole history of uh, these practices in India is a whole kind of a very interesting story in itself. And, you know, there's been a, a number of people have written about this. Um, there's a, you know, recent book by um, my team. There are other others working on this. Um, but I think, um, I mean, as you probably know, you know, India was the place where there was one of the very few examples in history of uh, men being targeted for forcible uh, vasectomies during the, um, the emergency when civil liberties were uh, kind of openly suspended. I'd argue now they've been suspended without an emergency being declared, but at that time they were kind of openly suspended for two years. And in that period, you had this uh, men, you know, 
from poor communities, many of them from minorities being herded into camps and, and being given vasectomies. And this really was in a way one of the, the things which brought about the downfall of that government and basically, you know, this will never be repeated. It was obviously proved to be something that people would not accept. And since then, it's been almost exclusively uh, sterilization of, of women, even though, uh, as we know, it's, it's, um, it's a very dangerous procedure relatively. Um, now, I mean, I think that there's also, you know, there's that longer history as well around kind of eugenics in India and, um, you know, India having its own branch of that, of that thinking, uh, which very much drew on, you know, um, caste supremacist ideas, ideas of like, um, you know, that, that, that Indian systems, you know, incredibly hierarchical systems, which also involved, um, caste endogamy were, were kind of somehow, uh, you know, legitimized and proved the value of eugenicist thinking, you know, where people were only marrying people from the same caste. Um, and of course, a lot of the people who are targeted, the women who are targeted in these coercive uh, sterilization measures are from um, oppressed castes or their Dalits, uh, or they're from indigenous communities. So, so there is very much in a way, this idea that these people need to be controlled. And so it's not just that it's permanent and that's seen as you know, easier, better value for money, but also the kind of drive to, to control is very, very much built into the dominant ideology. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, there's been this reliance on, on female sterilization. So in a way, um, uh, in practice, these discourses of choice are not very, very kind of salient in these policies at all. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the other thing we've seen is uh, privatization. So we've got, um, you know, doctors, private doctors being given incentives to, you um, to carry out sterilizations, being given awards for the numbers of, of, of sterilizations they've carried out and this kind of thing. Um, so it's very much kind of embedded in, in uh, Indian policy. Um, and although now, you know, having actual camps has been outlawed, it's still very much, you know, very, very prevalent. And, and, and I think, you know, if, if we're going to link it to the wider population discourse, um, you know, there's, you also see this idea that women are not to be trusted, you know, the idea that, um, you know, the reason that implants and um, injectables are so, so good is that women don't have to remember to take a pill, you know, women can just uh, be given this and then, you know, they don't have to take any kind of initiative. And in a way, sterilization is the kind of end point of that kind of thinking. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, that it's a very interesting question, certainly, about its, its prevalence in India. Um, Phoebe. Hi, Dave. Uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. It's kind of ties into a lot of what I've been doing recently. Um, but what my question is really about the kind of the challenge that this context poses to contemporary feminist discourses. So I work in the Peruvian context, and it makes me think of at the time where we're facing, well, on the one hand, a lot of threats to abortion rights and campaigns to expand abortion rights, it proposes a great challenge to feminist discourses, this wider context of ongoing kind of coercive family planning policies. And so the idea of the sort of classic feminist slogan of my body, my choice, becomes a bit more thorny and complicated than it would sort of, as we understand it. And I wondered, it's sort of, a, it's a question I'm still thinking about, but I wondered what thoughts you had on what challenges this context poses for feminist discourses. I mean, I think it's interesting because, you know, like the, the kind of classic story around this is, you know, as I mentioned, this idea that, you know, um, you know, abortion rights were kind of, you know, the demand of, of white feminists. And then you had these other demands coming from, um, you know, 
uh, black feminists and, and women of color and indigenous women, but, but it's a bit more complex because of course, you know, as you're saying, I mean, you know, in, in much of the global South, there are also these really intense struggles over the right to abortion. And, and I actually think that this isn't, um, you know, a binary. I don't think it's, it's at all the case because if you, you know, you mentioned Peru and in Peru, you have all of this happening. You have these really intense struggles over abortion rights. You also have, of course, the history of forcible sterilization of indigenous women, which is also very central to, um, you know, reproductive justice questions. So very often both of these things are actually coexisting. And that's why I always mention that, you know, many people aren't aware, for example, that the Gates Foundation has this anti-abortion position. And that one of the reasons they're so keen on pushing um, long acting uh, hormonal contraceptives, apart from their you know, relationships with the pharmaceutical corporates and other things. But one of the reasons is that, is that those, those are seen as being that bit more, uh, more reliable and therefore more likely to, and that's important to them because it kind of then is supposed to, um, take away the need for safe abortions and so on and you know melinda gates has actually been quoted as saying that you know the united states can never fund uh, organizations which provide abortions you know this was in the context of being critical of donald trump's um, extension of the global gag rule um, in terms of its impact on family planning provision in general but she made it very clear that this was her position and um, and this, you know, I mean, it's but a lot of people don't realize that because it's seen as being very polarized. You know, there's, you know, campaigns around abortion on the one hand, and on the other hand, abortion campaigns against coercive population policy. But I think it is, in fact, you know, part of the, you know, and for many women, it's both of these things at once. Uh, Sarah, do you want to unmute yourself, or should I read your question? Oh, I think I've unmuted myself. Um, yeah, great. Uh, well, yeah, um, yeah, and and first of all, thanks for such an amazingly comprehensive and clear account of these connections, so timely and important. Um, I did just, I would just be very interested in your view, since you have studied this for so long. Do you do you, in relation to what um, Rejak was asking about? what to say to the economists who say, well, actually demographic transition is a good economically uh, beneficial modernizing influence. Um, because um, I'm just wondering if you, if you share the view that a lot of demographers seem to, to share that actually that's never been proven. Um, and one of the most curious things about the quote unquote success of demographic transition theory is that it's actually never been empirically I mean, not, not like that necessarily matters, but do, but do you think, um, I mean, in the sense that if it's ideological, it doesn't matter if it's true, but I'm just wondering what's your kind of take on that? Do you, do you think that's significant that actually that's never been proven? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's never been proven. And also it in a way was never, you know, I mean, one can talk, you know, as I mentioned, there was this definite shift to it being much more kind of ideologically driven, but in a way it never was kind of free from that. And that does matter, as you say, I mean, I think it never, um, you know, it started off out of, you know, Malthusian ideas, which were from the beginning, very much linked to the idea of, um, of um, you know this fear of the working class and so on, this fear of um, uh, you know the, the the dispossessed and what they would do um, in the sort of you know uh, late eighteenth century, early nineteenth century um, in 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 England, and then you know it it kind of you know continued through the colonial period. So you see this very. Um, it, it, it always, this has never been a kind of an idea which one can kind of separate off and look at kind of objectively, even though, you know, that was what demographers have, have claimed to do and seek to do. I mean, I, I think that each context where, uh, you know, one can see, you know, the reduction in, 
uh, fertility accompanying various changes. But as you say, one can't necessarily, um, you know, that's, you know, the kind of typical sort of fallacy, really, isn't it? That one can't make that connection, that causal connection necessarily. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of other things going on in those, in those processes. Um, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, I mean, for example, there's, you know, the idea that, you know, as, uh, as uh, it became less of a concern in England, and that was associated with England being able to sort of like export its population to, um, to the places that it had colonized, right, like uh, America and Australia and so on. Um, but, you know, this was also the period of a huge kind of, you know, in a huge uh, appropriation of resources from those parts of the world and from from you know, the places that that had been colonized. So you know we can't necessarily uh, you know sort of you know when we look at things which happened around in the nineteenth century, the kinds of transitions which took place, one can't necessarily and in the early twentieth century, one can't necessarily sort of focus on uh, demographic changes as having you know. A particularly important impact there. So I mean, yeah, I think it's um, yes, it's perhaps not very useful to look at that. I agree with you there. Um, so I have a question from Victoria Bateman, um, and it's uh, such a stimulating presentation. Thank you uh, very much for offering such an important insight. Can you? Uh, can I please ask though, in terms of uh, policy implication? Do you think the international community should simply stop funding family planning in the global south, or is it, or is the problem the way that such funding is executed, in terms of, i.e., um, the setting of targets, etc., which remove the elements of uh, of choice for individual women? Um, I mean, I think it's very difficult to answer that question actually because I mean. What do we mean by the international community, I think, is, is the question, you know, I mean, what are these, these organizations and these states and what do they represent, um, you know, so I think, you know, uh, you know, the, the way that this funding takes place, you know, as you say, the, the question of setting of targets and everything else that we've talked about, in a way, what I've been trying to show is that they are very much embedded in the particular goals of those organizations, which are linked to um, the kind of sustaining of, of capitalism, ultimately, and the kind of uh, promotion of, um, of uh, accumulation. Um, so I think in that sense, it's, it's, you know, it's a, in a way, it's about perhaps you know, transforming what we mean by the international community and, um, you know, rather than kind of telling them what well, that they should do this, we should actually think about, uh, you know, think beyond that and think, you know, think in terms of uh, what kind of visions are coming from below really, uh, as far as uh, what what should happen and what should, what should be done. Um, but I, I do think that like, you know, that these, these uh, institutions are not going to deliver even reproductive rights understood in quite a narrow sense, let alone reproductive justice. So we shouldn't expect that. So I think we have time for just one more question. So I might just read Jar Jara's um, question here. So hi, Kopana, thank you so much for this excellent and expensive talk. Uh, this is quite a specific question, but I was wondering if you have come across any of the conspiracy theories which claim that Bill Gates is promoting COVID vaccines because they will sterilize recipients and therefore help Gates achieve his desire for global population control or perhaps uh, more generally, what should we make of Bill Gates' um, intensive promotion of pharma pharmaceutical contraception at the same time as he fiercely protects um, the patents for COVID vac vaccines and limit access to vaccines? Yeah, I mean, I, I 
I do think that that is a conspiracy theory about vaccines, about COVID vaccines, and there are a lot of them around at the moment. So I would, you know, I wouldn't agree with that or, or um, you know, give it give it credit that that COVID vaccines can have a sterilizing effect. I think that's one of the um, myths which is being promoted, particularly in fact by you know the the far right in the U.S. and so on. Um, so I think you know we we should be very cautious and not not believe that. But um, I I I think it's not even a matter of Bill Gates having a desire for global population control. I think I think the point is that um, you know the Gates Foundation is basically uh, what's called philanthropic capitalism. It's closely linked with uh, you know a huge corporate and. Um, and yeah, I think that that uh, so it's not really about an individual desiring or not desiring uh, population control, but how those population policies fit in, as I said, with the interests of global capital and so on. Um, I mean, yes, the, the Gates Foundation has, um, you know, been at the forefront of um, uh, protecting patents and arguing against the lifting of, of patents on COVID vaccines, which obviously is um, one of the huge obstacles to, um, to uh, you know, vaccine equality globally. And that's a whole other discussion in itself. Um, 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 and yeah, I'm just looking at the comment from uh, Rishita. I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's that's um, that's right. The de demographic transition remains such a powerful force in population policies in the global south, um, and how they're experienced by uh, populations which are made marginalized. Um, and. Um, if that shifts where efforts to challenge these discourses or offer alternatives um, are targeted. I mean, I, I think that's definitely something to think about. I mean, whether, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, the, the um, in a way, talking about reproductive justice does require a kind of complete rethinking of, of in a way, the whole construct of, uh, of a population, because there are many, many, you know, elements within it. For example, at the moment, there's very much, you know, the notion of um, the demographic dividend, you know, so, so the sort of move away from uh, looking at populations as a whole and looking at them in terms of their age structure. So, you know, there's a constant, I mean, I think, you know, there's, and that again is sort of like, again, becomes uh, a reason for, uh, you know, population, the kind of population policies we've been talking about, you know, the idea that there's this, um, you know, what you aim for is the, the majority of the population being productive and economically active and, and less older people and also less children. Um, so these are kind of, you know, again, very much about who is valued and who is not. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think in a way, rethinking the kind of fundamental tenets of, of demography and the notion of a transition is very important. Well, um, thank you very much, like all uh, of you for attending and thank you very much, Kalpana, for being here. It was such an amazing talk. Um, so yeah, we're very grateful that you like took off your time to like share it with us today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed the discussion and, um, you know, I'm sure it's going to be a really exciting series. Um, thank you, Kalpana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all to organizers for organizing this amazing series. It's really brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.